He didn't move over there. I said, somebody got a little remote control over there. I said, he looking at me like, he ain't going to push no button. But I see technology. My bad, my bad. You got it, you got it, you got it. That was my daughter, Carmen. Thank the Lord for her. This is my wife, Bethany. Outside of salvation, greatest gift God has given me is my wife. We sing about Jesus, he's more than one. He promised us that he would be a counselor, a mighty God and a priest. Prince of peace, 
more than wonderful, amen. What a joy it is to be back here. I've lost track of time the last time we were here, and I want to say it hadn't been your pastor's fault. He's been so kind, and so gracious to just really give us an open invitation to come and be with you all, and time just happens, and it goes by, and the next thing you know, you forget how long it's been. I just believe God wanted us here tonight. We're honored to be here, and I'm thankful for the opportunity. I want to thank you for your hospitality and your kindness. I want to thank you, ladies, for the meal tonight and being so kind and gracious to us and feeding us. Thank you, Pastor, for the basket and for providing us a place to stay. We appreciate that. We take none of it for granted. Thank you, church, for coming to church on a Monday night. You know, uh, somebody went to school today and somebody went to work today. and I guess somebody did nothing today. Somebody's in there somewhere. What takes commitment to be here on Monday night? You know, I, I, I've learned that when folks come out on Monday nights, you know, they're, they're, they're more in than most. Uh, most, you, you can't get half, you can't get half the people to come on Sunday morning. And then to come back on Sunday night, to come back on Monday night. So you're here because I, I believe you want to do something for God. And I want to commend you even before I start preaching for being here tonight, being in this place. I'd like to really commend the young people. I'm so happy to see how I many, my, my wife looked at me. Early in service, before it starts, there are a lot of young people. Boy, that's a blessing. It's a blessing. I go to so many churches, and there are no young people. And to see you young people. And some of you were here when I was here years ago. And you're growing up. You, you boys are growing into men. And I'm so proud of you. And I thank God for what you're doing. And I want to commend the pastor. Not that my commendation means anything. But thank you for coming to this city and sticking with it. And loving the people. Bringing your family into this city. And your precious wife. And children. And uh, I look at Dale and I think, good night. What are you feeding him? Uh, so he and I were in New York together several years back riding on a go-kart together. I don't think either one of us can fit on the go-kart alone now. And uh, he's growing up and I'm growing out. But we're both growing in the Lord. Amen. And so, and your children, I just thank you so much. And your ladies have been together with our ladies at our ladies retreat. Pastor, thank you for trusting us with your ladies. And Miss Kara, thank you for bringing them. And my wife's heart has been knit with yours and, the, and our, the, our ladies and your ladies. And we just thank you for what you're doing and the kindred spirit, the bond that God gives us in Christ. Thank you so much for letting us come. I regret that we're only going to be able, be able to be here for one night. Uh, after you hear me preach, you might uh, rejoice. And uh, nonetheless, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, uh, Brother Allen, for the message tonight. And thank you for being here. And thank you for you and your family and your faithfulness, and thank you for sharing the word of God as God gave me tonight. I want you to open your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 6, and I'll respect the time, and I won't be long, but I do want to share what God's laid on my heart. 1 Kings, chapter number 6, if you would, for the preaching of God's word. As we stand to our feet in honor and reverence to the word of God, The Bible reads in verse number 6, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. One said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. I said, First Kings, y'all in Second Kings? No wonder. You probably don't know what I'm saying, do you? I looked at my wife. When my wife looks confused, chances are everybody's confused. It was the Bible. I promise you it was the Bible. Go to Second Kings, chapter number 6. I've seen if y'all paying attention. Truth of the matter is, I said the wrong thing. Preachers don't like to admit they were wrong. I was wrong. It's the first time I can ever remember that happening, but I was wrong. I was wrong, and I promise you, I'll never be wrong again, at least in my own eyes. Isn't that how it is half the time? 2 Kings 6, everybody see, and the sons of the prophets. Said unto Elijah, behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, under Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us take a place, make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, 
master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Let the church say amen. Our Father, we pray that you add thy blessing to the reading of your word. As your vessel, I pray tonight that you'd cleanse me of sin, empty me of self, and fill me with your spirit. Help me to be a blessing. I'm totally convinced that the people of God did not travel to the house of God on a Monday night to merely hear a sermon from a briefcase. These last days, we need a word from the Lord. And oh, pray, I pray God tonight that I would not recite things that I've memorized or that I might, ju- might not just quote things that I've learned, but that I would truly be yielded to the Spirit of God. I pray that in this building, regardless of what's going on outside and around the world, that you would bind the devil. Put a hedge of protection about this place. He does not want revival. And the truth of the matter is, we don't want what he wants. We want what you want, God. So help us, Lord. I pray that you do a work in these few moments as we gather around the word of God. And I pray, God, that back at the house, you'd watch over my sons while we're gone. and Protect them until we get back home tomorrow. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. This chapter introduces us to the sons of the prophets. Without a doubt, these were young men training for ministry. And I would say in these last days, we need some young men training for ministry. I I don't think there's anything wrong being a doctor or a lawyer or being a scientist. I don't think there's anything wrong with picking up trash every single day or troubleshooting computers. But we certainly need men of God that will train for the ministry, that will be excited about the work of God and committed to preaching the word of God and and have a vibrance for the things of God. If a man desireth the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. He's saying to every young man in the building tonight, it's a good thing to want to be a preacher. Somebody say amen. These are the sons of the prophets that are training under Elisha. The pattern of the will of God. The older men to teach the younger men. The younger men to learn from the older men. That is the design of Almighty God. They're training in a place and they've run out of room. The Bible says they approach Elisha. Saying because the place where we're dwelling is too straight, it's too small. We don't have enough room to get the job done. We asked your permission to go to Jordan to chop down some trees and build a larger space. Wouldn't you say it's a good thing to want a bigger space to do what you're supposed to do? I I think that you'd probably say here at Liberty Baptist Church, God keep giving us more room and keep giving us more people and keep building bigger buildings that we can do what you've called us to do. The response of Elisha is go ye. Absolutely. You can go. Well, since we got yes in the first answer, why don't we try a second one? Let's try another question. Would you come with us? Don't just send us, Elisha. Would you come with us? And the response from Elisha is, I will go. I think it's a good thing to ask people that walk with God to hang around you. I think it's a good thing to invite people that love God to join you. I mean, if I'm going somewhere, if I'm going soul winning, I want somebody that loves God with me. If I'm going to the house of God, I want somebody that loves God with me. If I'm going to attack the devil and live for God, I want somebody that loves God with me. Elisha, we've seen God on you, and we're going to do something good. We'd like you to join us. And again, the answer is in the affirmative. I will go. To hear the sons of the prophets and Elisha headed to the Jordan to chop down trees to build a bigger space to do what God has called them to do. Say amen if you think that's a good thing. Well, as they're there, the Bible tells us about one of them. He's swinging his ax and he's cutting down a tree. He's going to use that tree and that wood that he cuts down to build a bigger space. He's doing a good thing and he has a good intention. But while he's doing a good thing with a good intention, something bad happens. Do you think it's possible to be doing a good thing with a good intention and something bad happens? Absolutely. This is what's happening in this man's life. He's swinging the axe, and while he's swinging an axe and cutting down a tree, the axe head, the sharp piece, the tool that gets the job done, falls into the water. Now watch this now. He can keep swinging, but if he keeps swinging and doesn't have an axe head, he can't get the job done. So he's got a problem. He's got a problem. He didn't come there to fish. He didn't come there to skip rocks. 
He didn't come there to get a break from work. He came there to chop down trees. He's swinging an ax to chop down trees, and the ax head is in the water, and he can't chop down trees until he gets his ax head back. You know what I like about this story? At the beginning of the story, we find out he leaves, he goes to do it, and he loses his axe head. But at the end of the story, he gets his axe head back. Aren't you glad when stories have a good ending? I'm telling you what this man realizes. I need this axe head to get the job done. I want to get back to doing what I came to the Jordan River to do. And the only way I can get back to doing it is to get my axe head back. I couldn't help but think while I was sitting here tonight on a Monday night at an independent Baptist church with a crowd of this number of people sitting in the building. I've got to believe that if you're here tonight, you came with a good intention. You came with a good purpose. You're not here just to play patty cake or bingo. You want to live for God. You want to honor God. You want to raise your kids right. You want to stay pure until you get married. You want to stay married to that wife. You want to live for God. Read the Bible. Fall on your knees. But it is possible to have good intentions and a bad thing happened. I couldn't help but think that sitting in the middle of the night are dedicated people who would leave the house, work all day and still come to church on a Monday night but somewhere along the road while doing a good thing with good intentions, you've lost your axe head. You have no fire anymore. No vibrance anymore. No drive anymore. No excitement anymore. Oh, you're still swinging. You still come to church. You're still singing the choir. You're still on the bus route. You still carry a Bible but your Bible's not carrying you. You sing about Jesus, but Jesus isn't the reason why you sing. You're in church, but you don't have any fire in you. It's possible to be in a good place trying to do a good thing and something bad happened. All around America, revival is a lost art because we got people that are still swinging axes without an axe head. It's not enough to come to church. It's not enough to go through the motions. It's not enough just to do the right things. We need an axe head. And I jumped in a car loaded my wife and two daughters up and came up 95 north to tell you you may have lost it but in Jesus name you can get it back yeah. wouldn't it be something if you went home tonight and said I didn't just go to church I got my axe head back yeah. I'm gonna get back on fire for God <laughs> listen 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 I've been sitting here like you here you're here tonight I heard the sirens come on I heard the rap music I even heard the ice cream truck start to run out there, start to run out there and get me a push-up for real. One of them cookies sandwiches, yeah. That rocket ship with the red, white, and blue. Come on now. Can I get an amen for the ice cream sandwich? Might even get some wrap snacks. Come on now. In the name of Jesus. I heard, I said, honey, that's the ice cream truck. Talk about nostalgia. God about to move in the service tonight. The ice cream truck done rolled by. Amen. Jesus stood still and the ice cream truck rolled by. I'm telling you, it couldn't help us sit here tonight and think it would be really easy to sit in this building tonight and think, oh, how they need God. Oh, how this city is so messed up. Oh, how everybody that was shooting ball across the street needs to be. But let me tell you something. They're not in here right now, but you're here and I'm here. And maybe God will get them if he gets us first. And maybe God will win them if we get our axe head back. I can't preach to the ball court. I can't preach to the drug addict. I can't preach to the crack addict. But I can preach to the men, women, boys, and girls sitting in the building tonight. Just maybe you can get your axe head back. By the grace of God. By the grace of God, I believe you can. Let's follow this man through the story. Let's find out what happened in his life when he lost it. Let's find out what happened in his life so he could get it back. Let's find out what ought to happen in your life when you lose it. Let's find out what should happen in your life if you'll get it back. Three things tonight, three factors of this story. Number one, a sober reaction. A sober reaction. What did he do when he lost it? I'll tell you what he did. The Bible says he cried. Verse 5, I said he cried. And, and, and then I, when he cried, he said this, alas, master. Uh, the word alas is an expression of grief. It's a, an expression of pity or concern. Watch this now. It bothered him that he lost it. I said it bothered them that he lost it. There was a broken spirit in this man when he lost something that he needed to get the job. Does it bother you that you lost your prayer life? Does it bother you you're not excited about soul winning anymore? Does it bother you that you quit tithing? Does it bother you that, bother you that your marriage isn't what it used to be? 
Does it bother you if you've lost your testimony? Does it bother you if you're not on fire for God like you used to be? I'll tell you why most people don't get it back. They don't mind losing it. I'm telling you, he said, alas, he didn't say no big deal. He didn't say, well, everybody else lost it. He didn't say, I really didn't feel like swinging it anyway. He didn't say, what's the big deal? Ain't that many people swing? No, 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 no. He said, alas, master, alas, master. You want revival tonight? You ought to be broken when you're not right with God. I ought to be broken when I'm not what I used to be with God. I ought to be broken when I'm drifting away from God. I'm telling you, it's a shame when the pastor's more broken about your axe head than you are yourself. It was a broken spirit. I believe there was a blundered stewardship for it was borrowed. A blundered stewardship. What is a stewardship? A stewardship is when I manage something that belongs to somebody else. Huh? St stewardship is not owning anything. Stewardship is managing something for someone else that owns it. And here's what this fella said. Oh, this bad news. I can't swing and cut nothing down if I don't have an axe head. Watch this now. You can't do the work of God that God's called you to do without your axe head. But here's what bothered him even more. It wasn't even mine. It wasn't even mine. Watch, watch this now. Somebody loaned it to me. And they loaned it to me with this thought in mind. Take care of it. Use it properly. Watch this now. And bring it back to me the way you got it. Somebody help me preach. He said, I, I, I got to get that thing back. It ain't mine. I got to get that thing back. Somebody else owns it. I got to get that thing back. That they're expecting me to return it. I'll tell you why. You need your axe head back because your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, you must glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are, oh, they my kids. No, they're not your kids. They're God's kids. Oh, that's my house. That's my car. Oh, it ain't your house, your car. It's God's house and God. Oh, that's my job. Oh, it's my voice. Oh, it's my time. It's my cell phone. It, no, it ain't yours. Nothing you have did you get on your own. Nothing you have that belongs to you. It all belongs to God. And he gave it to you with this thought in mind. Take care of it. Use it properly and bring it back to me. One day we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And God is going to say, how'd you use your time? How'd you use your talent? How'd you use your high school time? How'd you use your friendships with other people? I gave it to you. Now bring it back. The same way you got it. Amen. Does it bother you when you misuse God's stuff. <laughs> That's God's tithe. I tell a lot of people, don't get nervous when I start talking about tithe, and I ain't ta start talking about your money yet. Yep, that's right. The tithe is the Lord. Right. You can't spend on what you want to spend on. It's not yours. Right. It's God's. Yep. You quit soul winning. That's God's tithe. Yep. You quit raising your children the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Those are God's kids. Yep. Amen. Yep. There must be a sober reaction. Number two, there must be a strategic return. There must be a strategic return. Alas, master, he calls out to the man of God. Verse number six, and the man of God said. What do you mean a strategic return? I believe it requires some accepted support. This fellow was in trouble and he needed somebody else's help. I'm finding out that most of the time the reason why we don't get help is because we won't let nobody help us. Huh? Alas, master. In other words, man of God, I'm in trouble. I need help. You know what? Uh, we're so messed up sometimes, we don't want nobody helping us. Don't listen, when you're rebellious, don't get mad at your parents. When you're out of the will of God, don't get mad at the preacher. When you're not doing right, don't get, don't get mad at your friend and say, you know what? You didn't used to do that. Don't get mad at that godly brother or sister in Christ that called you. I, we had church, we had revival. I didn't see you there. I mean, listen, if you're in trouble, don't you think you need some help? Right. And listen to me, just because help's available doesn't mean help is accepted. Here, here's what he says, alas, master, I, I need help. I, I need help. Listen to me. We're so full of ourselves. We're, we're so independent. We, we so think we have it all together. Let me tell you something. Nobody has it all together, but God has provided us help from his word, help from the men of God, help from other godly people. You want revival tonight? Accept the help. Not only was there accepted support, but there was an acknowledged spot. Listen to Elisha's question. Where fell it? <laughs> you lost it? You want to find it? Where did it fall? Where are you dropping it at? I mean, if you want to pick it up, you need to find out where you dropped it. I hear Christians say all the time, I'm not what I used to be for the Lord. I don't have any joy anymore in the Lord. God and I are not close like we used to be. I asked him, what were you doing when y'all were close? I mean, when you had joy, what was it you were doing? Hey, listen, 
For some of you, I've just met you for, for the first time tonight. For some of you, I've met you before, but I don't know a lot about your life. Could I tell you without you even telling me what's going on in your life? Could I tell you, I can tell you some things about you without you even talking to me. I can tell you, you have joy when you walk with God. You have peace when you have a proper prayer life. Listen to me. You have contentment when you're living in obedience to the principles of the word. Listen to me. You have excitement when you're winning people to the Lord. God protects your finances when you're faithful in your giving. I'm telling you, if you've lost your joy, go back to where you lost it. Start reading your Bible again. Meet God early in the morning. Fall back on your knees. Have a burden for souls. Start giving 52 weeks out of the year. I'm saying it's not rocket scientists. Walk with God. And if you lost your joy and your excitement and your satisfaction when you stop walking with God, don't watch Oprah. Don't call Dr. Phil. Go back to doing what you used to do when you were enjoying serving God. Where's Sally? When you were coming to church three times a week, weren't you enjoying God? Yeah. <laughs> when you were not only reading that Bible, but you were applying it, weren't you enjoying God? Go back to the place where you lost it. There must be a sober reaction. There must be a strategic return. And lastly, there must be a supernatural remedy. Look at this moment. I, I, I don't care how many ministries you're in. I don't care how many services you attend. I don't care how many offering envelopes you fill out. If you're going to get your axe head back, you need God. I said it's going to take God. Listen, listen, listen. If we, listen, if we're going to find a little piece of iron in a big, dirty river, we need God. Come on now. I, I listen to me. I, you can get the be best snorkelers out there. Uh, he was telling me he went snorkeling. I said, ain't no black man meant to be snorkeling. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I'm telling you, but you know, there's an exception to every rule, right? I, I, I'm scared of getting in the, in the water. I, 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 you, you say, I never hear about them black folk getting killed by that. Yeah, because we don't get near them. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But, 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 but he's telling me, listen, you get the best snorkeler. You get the best diver you want. You, let me tell you something. You ain't going to find that little piece of iron in that Jordan River. It's going to take God. Let me tell you something. You think, Pastor, I'm too far away from God. I've messed up too long with God. I've done too many mistakes. I'm telling you, you can get your axe head back, but it's going to take God. I'm telling you, it's God which worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it in the day of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it takes God and God. God is able. Amen. Remarkable power. <laughs> so what's, what's Elisha going to do? It's right about that time we need one of them sanctified spiritual phrases, don't we? Hallelujah. Shelly bought a Nissan, Shelly bought a Honda. I used to wonder what kind of tongues they were talking. I found that he slowed it down. Shelly bought a Nissan. She should have bought a Honda. That's what they're saying. <laughs> it ain't no tongue talking. Shelly bought a Nissan. Should have bought a Honda. Shelly bought a Nissan. Should have bought a Honda. <laughs> Glory to God. Boy, that been one of these modern day preachers. That's what they said. Sometimes you switch it around. Shelly bought a Honda. Should have bought a Nissan. Nah, you switch it around. Oh, oh, common, oh, common man of God didn't say no sanctified phrases. He cut down a stick. Yeah. It's going to be a God thing. Well, watch this. Now, he's going to use an unlikely method. Not, not some fancy phrase. Not some slap upside the he head. Not, 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 not some sanctified sweat. Not some boom shaka laka laka laka. No, no, none of that. We're going to cut down a stick. Can I tell you something? Maybe you need God, but maybe you can't get God because you've already decided how he's going to do it. I, 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 I've, I've been someplace and seen somebody, and they told me, I hear you're going to be preaching in three months. Can't wait till you get here. I'm going to get right with God. And I want to say to them, like God needs me to get there in three months till you get right with God. 
Maybe, maybe you're ready for God to speak to you as soon as you hear your favorite preacher. Maybe you're ready for God to move in the service if the choir would just sing your favorite song. Maybe you're ready for God to do something if you just get a check in the mail, a, a text from somebody that you weren't expecting, a, a good diagnosis from the doctor. Maybe the reason why you can't get your axe head back is because you've already put God in a box and maybe he's just going to cut down a tree. Maybe you don't need some fancy sermon. Maybe you just need to read your Bible, that same verse, that preacher you hear every week, that story that you've heard a thousand times, that little child that's been trying to tell you all along, it's not about the bing, bang, boom. It's about God's will being done. The unlikely method, the undeniable miracle, the iron did swim. I think we read the Bible so much we act like this stuff happens all the time. You ever seen something go down in the bottom of a river and all of a sudden just come up swimming? This is a miracle. <laughs> we say things like the Bible, and God parted the Red Sea and they walked across on dry ground. Did you hear what you just said? Like, when have you ever seen a man take a stick holding across water and the whole sea party? And a million and a half people walked across on dry ground, not mushy ground, dry ground. And then after they walked across, he took the same stick, stretched, across, stretched it across, and it, and it closed back up and drowned up the enemy. That ain't Steven Spielberg. That ain't, that ain't Disney. That's a miracle of God. The devil can't counterfeit God. The world can't counterfeit. Listen, the iron did something. You say that's a miracle. And I'm telling you what, God still does miracles. You can get it back. You hear me now? You can get back to serving God. You can get back to reading that Bible. You can get back. On, I know it's a postmodern society. I know politics is run amok. I know people act like they lost their mind. I know that cray cray has become popular. But I'm here to tell you there's still a God that's able to give it back to you. You can get back to being what God wants you to be through God's power. There's a remarkable power. But beloved, there must be a responsible process. You're not off the hook. Neither am I. It's going to take God to do it. Yes, it is. But that means, that doesn't mean you and I get to do nothing. Huh? The responsible process involves a realized availability. The iron did swim. And this fella had to see it swimming. Hey, listen to me. You've got to believe it's possible for God to do something. You've got to see the availability of you're doing something for God. <laughs> Pastor, there are people that, that don't even envision that God could do. We keep talking about revival when half the people sitting there don't even believe in revival. Is the iron available? Can a young man sit in church and say, yes, when everybody else is losing his purity. Yes, when everybody else is caught up in wrong ideology. Yes, when the world is drowning out the voice of God. It is still possible for the power of God, through the Holy Ghost of God, to reach in my heart, call me to preach, preserve my life, and use me for his glory. Yes, it's possible. You must believe. You must see the available, the realized availability. But notice the pastor says he put out his hand. This is what I call reaching activity. Not just realized availability, but reaching activity. Come on, everybody. Some of you taking notes. I'll let you write it down real quick. And then after you write it down, do this with me. The Bible said he reached out his hand. Come on, reach it out. Reach it out. Now, now the Bible said he reached out his hand. I ain't making it up. It's there. He reached out his hand. Now watch this now. Two people are going to leave service. You can put it down. Two people are going to leave a same service. And one of them is going to leave service and say, my, 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 God showed up. Woo wee, woo wee, woo wee. Boy, that preacher was right at me. Boy, the Holy Spirit was here tonight. Boy, Jesus sure stood still. Boy, the Bible came alive. Boy, it, it felt like I was the only one in the auditorium. God changed my life. God gave me something that I can take and run to work with. I can run to school with. I can run to my family with. I can run and beat the devil up with. I can glorify God with. Boy, I sure got something out of revival this week. Woo! Let's go live for God! Somebody else will leave same service. It was all right. Truth be told, I was wondering when he was going to finish. I heard, I, heard, I, heard, I heard people preach on that thousand times. I wasn't thinking about nothing. I was trying to get home to the game. Huh? My stomach was hurting from that cinnamon roll that sister gave me. 
Now you explain to me how two people leave the same service with two different reactions. Two, two different reactions. There are a lot of ways we could explain it, but I'm going to use the scripture to explain it. One had his hand out and one didn't. Let me tell you, you keep, listen, listen, in three years from now, if you're ready to leave this church talking about you ain't getting nothing from God, don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody you left a Bible preaching church and got nothing from God because you without knowing it, you telling on yourself. If you come to a church that serves the Bible, all you can eat every service and you don't get nothing, you lazy or out of your mind because the only reason you can't get something at a smuggler's board is because you don't got your hand out. And I'm telling you, you want revival this week, you need to get back to reading your Bible with your hand out. Get back to coming to church with your hand out. Get, get back to singing songs with your hand out. I don't know. It seemed like Pastor kind of been off of it a little bit. He seemed like he lost. Pastor ain't lose nothing. He's still preaching from the same Bible. He's been preaching every week. You used to come to church with your hand out, but now you don't got your hand out because it's too full of carnality and worldly pleasures and all the sins that only give you fun for a season. Drop that mess before you get in here and say, open down mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of my law. If God fixed it, if the Holy Ghost served it, if Jesus sees it, Oh, help me, Lord. I'm putting my hand out. It takes a realized availability. It takes a reaching activity. It results in a receptive actuality. He took it. Whatever God has for you tonight is here for the taking. You can't blame anybody for what you're missing in your Christian life if you failed to take it. So when revival's over today, for the end of this week, you end Sunday, when revival's over on next Sunday, what member of this church can truly say, I didn't get revived? And who can you blame? I know. You got the wrong preachers. I could have told you if you got Baldwin and Allen and Shirley, you weren't going to get no revival. All three of them crazy. <laughs> Pastor, you had too many services. You had too many services. It was too long. It was too loud. The temperature in the auditorium wasn't set right. You picked the wrong time of the year. People got a lot going on. Students coming to the end. Got midterms, spring break going on. You held it at the wrong day. The noise. The, the, the rap music, the ice cream truck. <laughs> too many distractions. You, 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 you shouldn't have let the kids stay in the sanctuary. There's too much distraction. Too much distraction. You, you having that at night before people get a chance to really get settled in and, and kids do their homework and have a good meal. You had the wrong women cook. <laughs> if that's what it was, you had the wrong women cook. If you serve fried chicken to everybody, everybody would got revived. Come, come on, now, now we're laughing. We're laughing. But we come up with every excuse why we didn't get from God what God made available to us. Listen to me. Cut out all that nonsense. I'm telling you the buffet line is open. The plate's up there. The fork's up there. Get up off of your blessed assurance and yeah. put something on your plate. Yeah. Take it. Take it. Don't come to a buffet line talking about, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I don't know why I don't got no food in my mouth. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I've been waiting all day to eat. Ain't nobody give me no food. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Can you smell? Can you see? Are you blind? Are you out of your mind? You see all that chicken, all that mashed potato, all that macaroni and cheese, all them collard greens, all that nettle pudding, all that apple pie. You see all of it. You see this Bible here from Genesis to Revelation. It's a full-fledged, hot, fresh buffet. Get up and take Take it. Take it. Listen. Listen, young lady. You leave this building, go five years and get pregnant. Don't you blame this preacher. Don't you blame this preacher. God, God gave you a Bible every week. And everything in that Bible that you need will keep you from getting pregnant and will get you to the marriage altar. You are not just a man, but God's man for your life. If you wreck your life, don't get on social media and talk about that church ain't never do enough for me. That church was the only reason you know Jesus. Some point along a while, you start getting full of yourself and quit reaching your hand out. And now, you're out there swinging with no access. I'm telling you this story, he lost it, but he got it back. And by the grace of God, if you've lost it, in Jesus' name, tonight, you can get it back.
Father, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for working in us. I want to ask you tonight, if you've lost something, if you're not where you used to be with God or not where you should be, come on, get up right now. Don't wait on anybody. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Leave your seat. Mind God. You're here tonight and you're not sure you're going to heaven. Come ask somebody to show you. Listen to me. You don't have to leave this building on your way to hell. You may have been here for the very first time tonight and you're not sure where you're going to go when you're going to die. Listen to me now. Come find me right now. You tell me. I don't know where I'm going to go when I die. I'll have somebody show you. I'll have somebody show you how you can know you're going to heaven. You come let me know. Come on. This is serious.